So this story is the landscape of knowing. I'd like to offer a bit of landscape for knowing Ernest Morrell. He was valedictorian in junior high and graduated high school at Summa Cum Laude. <clears throat> However, he noted that he was viewed by his teachers, peers, coaches, and community as an athlete first and foremost. But midway through college, Ernest reflected <clears throat> that selecting English as a major forced him to think of a future beyond athletics. He became an English teacher in Oakland Unified School District. It was 70% African American and Hispanic students and it has historically performed far below state and national standards. Although a school administration continually loaded his classes with students they saw as the worst discipline and achievement problems, Ernest had them explicating worse and adverse conditions to help them to understand how to reverse those very conditions. Even then, he brought high school students <coughs> to the university to present the research they were doing in their classes. One day, I visited his high school class and Chaucer was on trial. Some of the pilgrims on the road to Canterbury were extremely displeased with the way Chaucer had described him, <laughs> described them, and they brought a liable suit against him. <laughs> the class was organized into prosecuting and defense uh, teams, and the students also played the roles of the various pilgrims. At one point, Chaucer's defense attorney asked the wife of Bath, isn't it true, in fact, that you are a little deaf? And don't you, in fact, have big gaps between your teeth? And aren't you really a little wide of earth? And haven't you indeed had five husbands? At the moment of thought, the young woman responded, yes, these things are true. But who gave Chaucer the right to write and publish them about me? <laughs> Despite the spectacular results with the, with the students, Ernest was also aware of the larger institutional forces work, working to inhibit this kind of learning. He felt he could do more. So he returned to graduate school at UC Berkeley and completed his PhD in 2001. He won the Outstanding Dissertation Award. Within three years, he had published two books, Becoming a Critical Researcher and, Link and Linking Literacy and Popular Culture. In 2007, he published Critical Literacy in Urban Youth, and in 2008, he co-authored with Jeff Duncan Andrade, The Art of Critical Pedagogy. He published two additional books in 2009 and has continued to publish prolifically into the present. <clears throat> Several years ago, I went to NCT in Orlando, Florida, a place that's somewhat similar to this in terms of, you know, a dizzying world. <laughs> and I thought I would check in with Ernest because I saw his name on the program. And I went to the uh, presentation and found that it really was just a graduate student, I shouldn't say just, but it was a graduate student presenting the work of Ernest Morrell. Uh, several weeks ago, an amazing teacher who came through our program at UC Berkeley about five years ago and had been teaching uh, uh, really effectively in uh, urban public schools, decided that she wanted to go back to, uh, and get a doctorate and was talking to me about the program. And in the meantime, she indicated uh, how she became inspired to be a teacher. It turns out that she had taken an urban education class at UCLA, and even though she was a psychology major, she uh, was inspired to move into English and become an English teacher. She has an article in the book that we just published called uh, The First Year of Teaching, which is available uh, in the, uh, in, 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 in the uh, conference uh, presentation places. And uh, the thing that was interesting that what motivated her research is something I think that we can all uh, learn from. One of her students, after she had told her that she was failing in her class, said, if I fail as a student, don't you fail as a teacher? 24 hours ago, Ernest's former student from uh, Montana State, <clears throat> Robert Trone, was talking to me and probably talk, uh, explaining how he had brought some of his undergraduate students here to present at NCTE. One of the students had said right after the uh, presentation, I really felt I had contributed something. We have all seen Ernest bringing large groups of high school students and undergraduate students and as well as graduate students to NCTE, AERA, and other conferences. And all these students are making amazing research contributions. Mm. After an accelerated promotion to tenure at UCLA, he, was, he is now a full professor at Columbia, director of the Historic Institute for Urban and Minority Education, and holder of an endowed chair. His research talks and keynote presentations have outstanding room only crowds of academics and practitioners. Many are rising scholars themselves 
all of them conceptually influenced and professionally inspired by Ernest's example. <clears throat> Across this work, we see all five of NCT's principles for moving forward in the 21st century. Literacy as everyone's job, authentic evidence of learning, inquiry and teaching and learning, the power of collaboration, the operationalizing of shared leadership. For those who aspire to stand on the broad shoulders of this impressive body of work, just beware, you must not be afraid of heights. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming a warrior poet, an exemplar of powerful English, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the National Council of Teachers of English Presidential Speaker for 2014, Dr. Ernest Thank you for that, Jabari. Um, Jabari is one of those people without whom I would not be here. Um, thank you for taking a chance on me and for not telling me I was crazy um, with all those ideas that I came to you with so many years ago. Um, to quote my, my friend and, and partner, Howard Tenberg, uh, this one's for Ken. Powerful English at NCTE yesterday, today, and tomorrow toward the next movement. You know, I started this uh, talk thinking about powerful English today and tomorrow moving forward, and something felt not right um, in, in portraying ourselves in that way, uh, because it is unconscionable to think of ourselves as at the beginning of a movement, or at the beginning of the first movement in the history of NTTE. Uh, NTTE has been a bowel movement, and to say that we haven't is to dishonor the legacy of those who have come before us and have worked so hard on our behalf. So I added a yesterday, today, and tomorrow because I think that we don't often reflect on who we are and what we have become to think about where we need to go. So it is not towards a movement, it is toward the next movement or another movement because that is who we are and what we do. Deborah Brandt, in Reading the Past, Writing the Future, said, what we take for granted in our professional background is there as a result of somebody's insight and effort. In retrospect, we appreciate how the activism of forebears built the house which we do our work today. Reading is constructive, writing is processed, language is a heritage, right? Assessment is formative, teachers as leaders, scholarship and pedagogy as one. We assume these truths to be self-evident, but only because NTTE members studied, taught, argued, and presented them into existence, making them programmatically real to the wider field. And so this begs the question, whose forebears are we? What do they need from us now? So I want to go back to the beginning of NTTE and movements. You look at the report on the Committee of Home Reading, which sold 400,000 copies in 1913. NTTE members were concerned with the undue influence that the College Board had on the selection of reading texts. Even then, in 1913, NTTE members are saying, you need to read different books. There are other books out there. So much so that they basically neutralized the influence of the College Board and it began exploding the canyon over 100 years ago. We see that continued with the work of the Black Caucus and others in the African American reading. In the 1940s, NTTE stepped out front to think about teaching in a context of war, a context not unlike today, almost 80 years later. Um, how do we talk about freedom? How do we talk about peace? How do we talk about democracy in a time of war? And what is the role of an English teacher in that process? How can we think that teaching English is not a political act? <laughs> In the 1960s, NCTE was far out front thinking about teaching English to speakers of other languages. Um, we're having this conversation now in 2014 as if we've all of a sudden become a multilinguistic nation. Um, we've been a multilinguistic nation since we made it a nation and other people were speaking languages other than English when we got here. <laughs> and NCTE was out in front of us even in the 1960s. Anti-censorship um, and the wonderful work that Leah really and her colleagues are doing now um, in 2013, 2014 in fighting censorship. NCTE had anti-censorship statements going back to the 1960s. And I love this, uh, this note because it sums up so much of what I think is a part of NCTE. Um, you can read it. It's a letter um, written to um, the director of publications in 1963 about fighting the, um, the good fight against Catherine Rye. 
and the part I love, and he says, alas, it was to no avail. It didn't, it didn't succeed, but NTT was still fighting, right? And that was over 50 years ago. Anti-racism, um, NTTE has been fighting against racism in curriculum and in American education. Uh, these two articles are from the 1970s. Um, in the 1960s, NTTE sponsored the Dartmouth Conference on the Teaching of English with the National Association of Teachers of English in the United Kingdom, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. It's really radicalized the profession, began to help us think about writing as a process and the amazing work that some of uh, my predecessors as NTTE presidents have pursued. We've also been out in front in terms of teaching diverse books. I love how Kathy's had that as a theme of this convention. Um, but Charlotte May Rollins was talking about this in 1943 in an NTTE publication, and Redeen Sims Bishop has been talking about it at least since the 1970s, her NTTE publication, Shadow and Substance, Afro-American Experience and Contemporary Children's Fiction. Um, we have had movements. Right, and we have been on the shoulders. Um, I'm on the shoulders of shoulders of shoulders of NTTE warrior poets who have fought for our children, who have fought for our discipline, who know that literacy is not only a civil right, literacy is the key to our humanity. I'd like to acknowledge a couple of our past presidents um, who have done this kind of work, Janet Emmett, and thinking about writing as a process, and, think, and writing and thinking and learning as intertwined, Yetta Goodman, who has taken us into the wonderful, rich, and and cultural world of our children, and they tell us that we cannot have a humane classroom until we honor those worlds in the classroom space. There should not be a divide between the classroom and the community. And here in her amazing work on um, writing theory and composition, writing groups, and looking at how composing is a process, of, a communal process that happens not only in the academy but in other spaces. Sheridan Blau's amazing work in literature workshop helping us think about how we bring text to life. Uh, the text itself is, is, is only a part of that transaction and the teacher needs to be an important part. Kylie Beard and her amazing work, um, helping struggling leaders, thinking about our responsibility as teachers and helping to cultivate these reading identities. And I just love that picture of someone kissing the book. Uh, you know you have arrived when your book is kissable and Kylie's books are not only kissable books. Kathy Yancey and her amazing work and thinking about portfolios and assessing and uh, moving us beyond thinking about um, traditional notions of assessment and even assessing writing in the digital age. Uh, Carol Jago and her amazing work helping a, a nation of teachers um, think about bringing people like Sandra Cisneros in the classroom. Um, my partner in crime on the presidential team, Keith Gilliard, who is disciplined and defining in himself and his connection to African American language and literature and staying true to the language game. So we think about powerful English today and tomorrow. How do we build? Uh, I love this question. Right? Whose forebears are we? Right? What do we need to risk in our own today to make possible 50 years from now a movement of powerful English? Because that is our responsibility. I like to think of beginning with who are we? Right? When do we begin to recognize as a discipline and as a field that we are a multiliterate, multilingual America, and that you cannot extricate the political enterprise from the teaching of English. And if you are not for social injustice, you are for social injustice. There is no in between. So what does it mean for us to be a multilingual, multiliterate discipline focused on social justice? Our American landscape, according to the Council of Great City Schools, which um, profiles the 60 largest districts in America, you can see the numbers behind me. Um, 38% of those students in our great city schools are Latino, 33% African American, 20% white, 7% Asian American Pacific Islander, 69% qualify for free and reduced lunch, which is measured by a um, family living in a percentage of the uh, federal poverty line. But we think about that, and we've often talked about that as urban education, and I just want to highlight um, only 28% of African American students attend a so-called urban school in a high need central city district. 72% of them are not. Only 24% of Latino students attend schools in those districts. 76% of them are not. And so this is a national issue. When we think about our multicultural America is in your classrooms no matter where you are. So in that light, I'd like to think about some of the key questions that we need to ask as a discipline in order to be able to move forward and address this multicultural America not as a challenge, but as our strength. Diversity is not the challenge. The challenge is our unwillingness to embrace diversity. Diversity is not a problem. 
The problem is our unwillingness to embrace and love our diverse selves. Like diversity is our greatest strength. It is our greatest strength. So that with that, the three questions that, that have, have been the focus of, of, of my work and I think the focus of, of, of our work as a field, and um, I think about contextualizing this movement as um, who is doing tomorrow today? Right? Tomorrow is happening today in our classroom, so we don't have to hypothesize about it. We can just point it out when it happens. Um, these three questions. How do we get students excited about learning? Instead of asking the achievement question, I ask this excitement question. When kids are talking over each other, hands raised in the tiger crouch, can't wait to speak, um, that's when we know that they are excited about learning, and that excitement increases engagement, that increases achievement. The second question, uh, I think about this, and, and folks like Kylie have been asking this question for years, how do we develop students' literate identities? Right? Instead of thinking about reading, let's think about readers. Instead of thinking about writing, let's think about writers. When I become a reader, when I become a writer, when I have that identity, you don't have to tell me to go read because I'm a reader, and that's what readers do. When reading is something that's decoding or for a test or it's beyond you, and you have to drag them to it, how do we make readers and writers of our students? And how do we make it socially, culturally, and technologically relevant? Um, I have to give a shout out to these two old people um, <laughs> who are my parents. Um, those years, 1967, and the question mark represents the years that they've been public school educators. Um, and the ideas about teaching that they have um, enculturated into me who have followed in their footsteps. The first one, where my mother says, um, if you wait for standards to go away, you will be waiting forever. <laughs> if you wait for the end of the struggle before you think about teaching for social justice, you will be waiting forever. Standards, barriers to achievement, poverty, inequitable conditions in school are no excuses for you not loving those babies. Uh, and no excuse for you not teaching. Another thing I've learned from my parents is that um, teaching is a privilege, it is not an obligation. Right? And so we have to embrace that. We embrace teaching as a privilege. And for my father, who said, I will not let anyone take away my right to dream. Right? As a teacher, I am a dreamer. His first retirement speech before he went back into teaching, he said, I wanted to retire a dreamer. I wanted to retire a dreamer, and I tell you today, I, my dreams are as vivid about the future of this American landscape as they were when I started. English teaching is cultivating youth voices. Um, this is a change, I think, is a part of the doing tomorrow today, as opposed to English as having voices of great literature imposed upon us, we think about ourselves as cultivating voices, especially in this productive digital age. We know the students have something to say, they're motivated. What we do in this transaction in the classroom is help them know how to say it, help them feel good about their ability to say it, help them to say it with power and authority, and help them to use their voices, whether they are eight or 18 or 80, to advocate for social change. There are great people who are doing that. I just wanted to give a shout to many of the members here at NTTE who are doing that kind of work. Valerie Kimlock, uh, Mariana Soto Manning, David Kirkman, Jane Parrish. There are many of those who are talking about what it means to kind of teach in a, in a revolutionary, multicultural way, right, that helps people to cultivate their voices and to speak the truth of power. We also have great work that's being done in our, our field on critical learning theories and that learning happens when you are able to participate and engage and not be dictated to. Um, or as uh, Paulo Freire says, um, to, be, to have knowledge deposited into your head. And we have uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful scholars like Carol Lee and Chris Gutierrez who have helped us in this regard. So what I'd like to do with the remainder of my time is talk about some of this, what, what tomorrow looks like today in these classrooms that are um, just warm your heart. And I think that we have to begin as a premise in getting the word out that excellent instruction happens every day in American classrooms. And if we want to figure out what to do tomorrow, look, look at what is excellent today. Instead of beginning assuming that there is a problem, the problem is that we don't acknowledge this wonderful teaching that is happening in our classroom. So what does this look like? So what, I'd like to start with this idea of developing powerful readers. I think about this and, and working with teachers and the, and the work that we do is really stemming around three questions. What do we read? How do we read? What do we do while and after we read? There's a political context for that um, that I think is at the core of this convention. How have we decided throughout history what is good to read and how do we decide today? One of the people doing tomorrow today is Deborah Applin and her critical approaches to the teaching of reading and thinking about um, the question is not just what we read, but how do we read? And, I, and, and the um, authors that uh, Kathy had on stage were talking about that, that 
any text is an invitation to a critical conversation. And that becomes important. There is a multicultural reading possible of every text. There is a feminist reading possible of every text. There is LGBTQ possible reading of every text. We don't have to find those texts that those realities are in every text that we read. What are we going to allow kids to bring their, their world, their lived experiences into their interactions with text and say, this is how I see myself in and outside of this text. And so Deborah's work is that. Um, Terry the same has done amazing work in thinking about um, how we think differently about selecting the books that kids read and her work on reading ladders, and I've just seen the lights come on with teachers as they think about uh, creating spaces for independent reading, um, creating topics that students are interested in, um, having a ladder that moves from books that are um, easier for them up to books that are more complicated. This is an example of a book ladder that we developed with teachers. Um, uh, dealing with issues that are related to African-American and Latino boys. Um, Down These Mean Streets by Perry Thomas, it kind of starts with Walter D. Meyer's Monster um, and ends with uh, W.B. Du Bois's Dark Water. And uh, watching young men come alive when they see themselves in these texts, and that's a part of the work that we do in thinking about what we read. Um, I've had the privilege of working with uh, teachers who do things like uh, use Tony Mark Morrison's Playing in the Dark to engage in a post-colonial literary analysis of video games like Resident Evil 5 and thinks it's okay to go ahead in Africa and shoot zombies and get points for that. So kids are playing these kind of video games and so I want my I want my students to be interested in literary theory. Uh, let's look at the video game as a literary text. Right? And they begin to break this kind of stuff down. Um, the classes of tomorrow and today are engaging in what I call a critical media pedagogy. Um, and engaging critical media analysis, we ask these kinds of questions as we look at commercials and billboards and uh, advertisements and internet sites. What does it mean to be normal or cool? What does it mean to have power? What does it mean to be desired? Who is marginalized and others? As my kids say, what does it mean to be not cool? As an audience member, how are you targeted? What assumptions are made by you? We have to understand um, that images like this wage war on our young people. Right? And I tell people, honestly, I have buried too many students over their inability to critically interpret these images. We bury too many of our students. This is a literacy that is a matter of life and death. Right? And uh, Bill Kiss was talking about uh, the Media Literacy Award, that this can't be an add-on right? when our kids are bombarded with images like this by the millions during their formative years. Right? And that is a part of the new English. That is people who are doing English tomorrow, today, are confronting this, not only creating more critical consumers of the media, they're helping young people be critical producers of the media. Um, so I have to give a, another shout to uh, the East Oakland Step to College program that has been directed by my partner in crime, Jeff Andrade, who began teaching together in Oakland um, almost 25 years ago. Uh, this program has amazing success. One of the things that they do in the Step to College is have a doctor block program, right? So they create these documentaries of life on their block. And kids become readers and writers in the traditional mode, but also the digital mode. They end up, um, it's hard to see on this image, but those bubbles around them are all the colleges that they're going to. And this is um, in East Oakland. That is, that is where I was born. And it, it, it has not traditionally been the norm, although it should be. And what Jeff's program shows is if you have the right English in your classrooms, it will be. Right? The variable is not in the students themselves. The variable is in our ability to reach them as educators. Southern California, fourth graders um, who live in a neighborhood that is six square blocks, has a um, homicide rate 25% of the entire county, come together and use Augusto Boas Theater, The Oppressed, to create poems and plays about um, their situation. What you see here are uh, images from these young people who are presenting to an audience about this side in a, in a, in a, in a, a model of, of, of theater where they're interacting with the audience and talking about violence and the solutions to violence. Um, these kids. Um, not only do well as poets and playwrights, but they begin to score well on their tests. This uh, program, I watch these kids come through, the first generations. Uh, many of them are now college students that have gone through programs that, that I've had the privilege of directing. Um, these kids become playwrights as ways to talk about the issues in their community. That's the New English, that's the English tomorrow today. We're using poetry um, to develop students as critical writers. Uh, Maisha Wynn's work. Uh, looking at, at, at poetry communities in, 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 in Brooklyn. I've seen um, the students from the Writing and Rhythm they've actually presented here at NCTE with some of my students, and how they talk about how poetry changes their lives. And, uh, you know, I have um, teachers I've worked with who talk about the, the creating of a critical poem. What does that mean to create uh, a critical poem? Uh, and, and, and the students say, a critical poem is about changing the world. Uh, and I. I was in a, a class where there was this conversation between um, two freshman uh, girls, and they were talking. One said, does a poem really change the world? Can a poem change the world? And 
The other student looked at her and she says, well, I know for sure that the poem changes the poet who changes the world. And that, you know, for 15 year olds who have that kind of conversation, why don't we teach poetry? Like, what, if, what do we have against poetry, right? For those of us um, who uh, are fond of that genre, I tell you, it does most of the things we want um, kids to do around writing. Uh, so I have kids do things like this where they're, um, you know, creating, um, you know, poems and art and, and kind of bringing those two together, mixing them together. Uh, we see the critical language pedagogy happening tomorrow and today. Uh, folks like uh, Elaine Richardson, um, African-American rhetoric, and Damian Baca thinking about mestizo scripts and uh, at the college level and that um, language is multi multilingualizing the discourse of rhetoric. And, and thinking about what that means to engage text at a real humane level, that kind of work is happening. Certainly, you know, um, folks like Geneva Smitherman and talking and testifying, uh, Keith already talked about, uh, Alim and his global linguistic flows, Gloria Anzaldúa and her multilingual text, The Borderlands. Uh, so that kind of work. There's no reason that um, an English class can't be a multilingual class when you have multilingual students, right? And so we have to take leadership in that. Some folks are doing that tomorrow, today. Um, Talina Los Rios, who um, is a, a, a student at Teachers College, uh, has a, a project where she's looking at Rasa studies in high school English, um, what that means um, to bring in uh, diverse literatures, what it means to have students thinking about themselves becoming advocates as a way of uh, teaching in an English class and producing uh, powerful readers and writers. So um, how do we develop students as writers? One of the things that, uh, that I, I've seen um, is connecting the act of writing to the act of communicating what we might call righteous indignation. Um, and, and I am one as a, as, as a teacher who, that you don't have to cultivate that righteous indignation. Students see it all around them. Or just sharing your stories, um, having your voice heard. What are the things that matter to you? What are the things that you love? Uh, we should not have a problem having things to write about because kids have so many experiences in their world that are important to them that they want to share and can share and need to share and are begging to share. And when writing becomes that process, it becomes more real. So we start um, in one of the projects that I, I, I directed for many years with high school students with these two questions. If you could change the world, what is one thing you would do? And if you could change your community, what's one thing you would change? And we started this process of identifying a problem, developing a question, designing a study, collecting data, analyzing that data, making claims, providing evidence, creating products, demonstrate, demonst disseminating those products, and taking social action. Uh, we developed all sorts of workshops and activities um, to help them with that. Um, it became and it continues to be an amazing um, project where, where students create PowerPoint presentations and research briefs and memoirs and blogs and uh, they tweet, they write letters to mayors and senators and speak and create PowerPoints and documentaries. Uh, they also become very successful secondary and post-secondary students in that process. Uh, they, they make all sorts of political impact, changing policies at school. Um, some of the work they, 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 they've done has become uh, like bills that have been presented on the floors of state assemblies. Uh, they, and as Jabari was, Jabari was alluding to, they have become presenters uh, to pre-service and practicing teachers. Another example, I've um, done this project in many states. Uh, I first saw this autoethnography project uh, through uh, Patrick Kamangian, who is a, a professor at USF and, and also a teacher at the, at the Step to College program in East Oakland. Uh, prior to that, he was a teacher in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, we began to develop this project of um, having students think about um, moving from myself to my community and my world uh, as, a, as an entree um, curriculum for ninth graders coming into a particular school in New Jersey where I was working uh, at the time, starting with narrative and poetry, writing their own uh, narratives and scripts, um, moving to my community where they mixed in the short stories and novels and began to think about themselves as located in the community ending with my world, kind of connecting these stories to kind of larger principles of social justice, connecting English to math, uh, they wrote reports. So one of the kids I remember starting with the question, how come so many people like me are dying on my block? It ended with talking about post-industrialism and the loss of joblessness in the city and, and what kind of change we needed to make and kind of connecting his own story to a post-industrial reality was, was his entree into literature, his entree into writing and becoming an intellectual. Another project that we did with students, um, A Day in My Life, uh, this was a particular program that was kind of targeted towards students who were um, in danger of dropping out of school. 
And uh, one of the things that we did with them is we started by asking, uh, take us through a day in, oops, I think I, that's really sensitive. Take us through a day, I won't touch anything else. <laughs> It's hard, you know, I mean, you gotta grip the podium sometimes, and I keep yourself from flying out there. It's like, it's like, yeah! Take us to day in your life, you know, and so this is a prompt that I do with kids, like, what do you see when you wake up in the morning? What's the first thing? What do you eat? What happens on the way to school? Um, what do you see on the way to school? What happens when you step on campus? And so we did this with the students, and they wrote it, wrote it, wrote it, wrote it. One of the students said, um, this, these were ninth grade, he said, you know, no one's ever asked me about a day in my life in school. So these, these students wrote essays, they created kind of digital essays to go along with these essays. Uh, they, they came to the university and presented them, and what you see here is uh, you know, from a website where uh, the students actually uh, published their work. Um, we've done work with uh, you know, students as oral historians, connecting um, their lives to uh, uh, the lives of, of others, and this was a particular project we did around Blessing Ultima, which is another one of those great novels that you might want to teach, and it's, uh, the novel itself is about um, a young person who's conflicted between cultures, the city and the rural, and Mexico and America. A lot of our students saw themselves as kind of conflicted between these two cultures. So part of reading the text, we had students um, engage in interviews with elders in their community, and uh, they wrote these oral histories. And so we've done this uh, many, many times, and, and if a novel has a, a historical element, uh, having the students become historians in their neighborhoods and communities and doing oral history as, as a way of getting into the text. Um, this is an example of, uh, um, how we connect the reading of literature with ele at an elementary level um, to, um, to this writing enterprise. This is a third grade class, and one of the things that we did with this um, group of students and uh, other elementary students at the time, we asked them to reflect on the anniversary of Brown to see whether or not we, we have more fair and equitable schools today than, we, than we've had. Um, so they read Ruby Bridges, the story of Ruby Bridges, and these are actual slides from this third grade class. Um, so these are their words that I was sharing with you. Uh, back in the days where we were born, white right, people we were mean to other people, didn't look like them, the world, they, they would um, treat them badly. Um, okay, they were different, and that was not right. So the students began actually using the story of Ruby Ridges to do a, a research project of their own school uh, to determine whether or not this, uh, their school was, was as resourced as other schools that, that were in neighborhoods where people had more, and whether that is actually a fair and just thing in a society like America to have that discrepancy. So this is a letter, um, you know, she says, Dear Mr. H is the area superintendent. This letter is about our school. We are studying the unit named Imagination Open Court. We want to make our school a better place. We don't have enough school supplies. The restrooms are dirty. Our school lunch is nasty. We don't have enough paper. And we don't have enough work either, uh, which is what she's saying, enough uh, classroom work. We interviewed kids in the third grade. And they said they didn't like the things in the school, and some they did. So um, she talks about the research process, the research process that they engaged in. Uh, they also talk about the oral history that they did. Um, and asking people what it was like to be bused, you know, what it, uh, what it was like being at your school. Um, this I love because only third graders could do something like this. Um, <laughs> it's funny. What, what, an what an indictment though, right? You know, really? It's just like they're, they're so honest, they don't know how to be anything but blunt, right? Um, but they had good teachers. Right, and that was in the middle. Uh, and they developed a play and acted out this play um, by the third graders. Uh, and, and so this was a part of Amazing Youth Summit. They did all sorts of multimodal composing, traditional composing. Uh, this is another example, um, understanding budget cuts. And this was, um, you know, uh, this is Angel, she's a fourth grader. And uh, each of the fourth graders at the end of the curriculum had to do a freedom and democracy speech. Uh, so they had to pick an issue that was relevant to them, they had to write a speech, and so for Angel's emergency budget cut, she did all sorts of work um, on the budget crisis and how that was affecting her classroom and her teachers being laid off. Uh, and then she started talking about the relationship between um, the budget crisis and crime. And people thought she was joking, she's like, you know, um, because of the budget crisis, uh, you know, people are committing crimes and they, they go to jail and then more money has to go into the prison system, but if we fix the budget on the front end and they had jobs, they wouldn't go to jail, and then there'd be more money for schools and our teachers wouldn't get fired. Mm. You know, not rocket science, right? This is a uh, fourth grader, and she's like breaking it down, I'm like, hmm, you know. <laughs> How old do you have to be to be governor in this state? <laughs> Let the 10-year-old do it. Um, you know, uh, 
another example that I wanted to share is uh, we, how we use poetry um, to inspire research. This is Langton Hughes, uh, um, an old neighbor of Keith, right? And, uh, and, and so, um, you know, he talks about dreams of birds. So what I, what I did with this um, particular poem is, uh, you know, we use poetry as a way to help students think about the research that they're doing. Uh, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Does it fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, a crust and sugar over like a syrup is sweet? Maybe it just sags up like a heavy load, or does it explode? And one of the things that, that I, I talk about is this idea of a dream, and many people do. Uh, you know, it is my belief that no kid steps onto a kindergarten campus in September um, planning to be a high school dropout. What we have, what we have in front of us are dreams. Each of those kids represents a dream, right? Their own dreams and dreams of those who love them and fed them and clothed them and dropped them off and who cry when they walk away. And so we are not as concerned as a society as we could be about the dream, but we want to throw all sorts of money at the explosion. Right, so that is in Langston Hughes poem, because if, if, you, if, you, if you start with a dream, it, it adds a little bit of a, of a moral um, imperative that, that you nurture that dream. Dreams only have to be nurtured. Explosions create all sorts of problems. It's much easier to nurture a dream than to deal with an explosion. So these high school students kind of connected that um, to the high school dropout rate and what, what we need to do in terms of how can the educational system um, further these dreams. Right? So these are some of the slides from the high school kids. This is a picture of them um, from our Council of Youth Research. We have um, Antero Garcia and Nicole Mera in the back who um, helped me run this program for many, many years. Um, this is them. This is what they look like when they're standing at the podium that the mayor normally stands at and they're speaking, the mayor is sitting and listening to them. Um, talking about the inequality of education um, and connecting that to theory and Gene Angen and the research that they've done and interviews they've conducted in their neighborhoods and surveys they've, they've distributed, uh, people they've talked to, uh, field notes, and, and, and they present their research. I don't show a lot of their slides that are in the middle, but they, they start with a research question, they go through that entire process. I love how they end. Um, you know, instead of having a conclusion at the end of their slides, they have demands because Frederick Douglass says the power can cease nothing without a demand that never has <laughs> and it never will. Um, and we also say, if you are speaking, if they have the audacity to let you get on the podium, don't ever let anybody leave the room without marching orders. Right? If someone is going to sit there and listen to you, uh, they need to leave with marching orders so they have this action plan for families, for students, for parents. Uh, for teachers and for policy makers. Uh, we've had all sorts of um, genres that these students have presented in, uh, research reports, conference presentations, including here, critical memoirs, policy briefs, plays, digital documentaries, PowerPoint slides, spoken word poems, social media sites, the list goes on and on. So what do we need to do to make the English of today that should be tomorrow the norm and not the exception in our classrooms? Well, we need to start a new movement, another movement. I love these quotes by Marion Wright Edelman. If you don't like the way the world is, you change it. You have an obligation to change it. Just do it one step at a time. And what she said on Friday um, that I thought was so amazing, stop talking about what's not possible. Or uh, as I heard Cornel West say it once, um, Nihilism is a bourgeois leisure. <laughs> Nobody has time for us to twiddle our thumbs and be hopeless. Right? Not the people who drop their kids off at the schoolhouse door and then go work in menial labor for hours and hours. What they're counting on is that what we are doing is nurturing hope. Right? So if we don't like the way things are, we have to change them. How do we change them? Um, a couple of the ways that I think are important is uh, what I consider critical action research. The work that we're doing, Jabari talked about his book, the first year teaching that uh, he edited. Um, the work that we do, the action research movement, the teachers looking into their classrooms, the work that's shared here at NTTE, what makes it critical? It becomes critical when that work is connected to uh, the conditions that surround that literacy teaching and learning in the classroom. This is what I am doing, but this is what I am doing in spite of and not because of, right? These are the regimes of standards and tests that I have to fight against. This is a culture of institutional racism that I have to fight against to get these books in this classroom. But when I get these books in this classroom, this is what my third graders do. This is what my community college students do. This is what my eighth graders do. This is what my 11th grade history of the Americas class, instead of the American history class, does. 
And how do we share that? Right? It becomes critical when we share it internally through our journals and our presentations, but it becomes critical when we share it through NTTE chats, when we share it um, externally, through social media, uh, on podiums, as part of activism. The best kept secret in English education is the daily genius in our classrooms that we sit on top of because we don't know how to share it. Right? Um, it's powerful inside the doors. It's revolutionary when it's shared. But we're not often taught to think of ourselves in that way. Who am I? Right? You've already talked about the Chaucer in the English classes, and, you know, 23 or who am I? Like, I know that the kids are engaged, but who am I to tell this story? Right? And that's part of what we have to do is see ourselves as, as telling those stories. Um, I tell people about being radicalized. I mean, I'm a child of the Civil Rights Movement. My parents went to school with the Black Panthers, but I just wanted to be a playwright. You know, and I wanted to teach kids about writing. Uh, I became radicalized when I became a high school teacher and saw the conditions that my children were living in, that I was teaching. And I, and I realized that uh, there are some things that we are doing here that I wouldn't mind seeing replicated in other classes. And so I had to overcome that, wanting to be a playwright, super shy. My aunt said, how can you be a teacher? You don't even like to talk. You know, and I am, uh, I am the, the shyest person I know. I really am. But, but it was love. It was love that did it. It was love for my students. And, and, it, and it was that love manifested in a sincere concern uh, for what was happening, but also uh, a sense of hope uh, that, that there's something we can do about it. Right, that, that there is a future otherwise. We also have to see ourselves becoming advocates for change. Um, I love the public composition, the public work of composition. Um, CEL, um, the, the Conference on English Leadership. Uh, some of these pictures are from our advocacy day. Uh, how do we advocate? Well, we advocate internally in our districts. Uh, we advocate with our departmental colleagues. We advocate to parents and the public in our neighborhoods. We advocate to um, school boards. We advocate to state boards of education. We advocate federally, right? If the people who teach communication can't communicate, who's gonna be able to communicate, right? We know how to do this. This is hard living, right? We are writers, speakers, thinkers, and teachers. Advocating is not complicated. The complicated part is having the courage to do it. We know what to do, right? I think the hard part is doing it alone. And so part of a movement um, is much easier to walk in front of that tank when you've got like 14 or 14,000 of your buddies walking out on that road with you. It's much easier to face fire hoses when they're like 5,000 of you and you are singing gospel hymns as you walk into those hoses. It is much easier when you're walking with people. NTTE should be the place to say, if you're about literacy and social justice, you don't have to walk alone. And you do not have to walk alone. So, so it's, not, it's not about making the case for advocacy. It's about making the case for you as advocates. And I know I felt the same way. I knew advocacy needed to happen, but who was I? Well, who are we? We are the most powerful literacy organization in this country. And, and we are the oldest literacy organization in this country. We have the power to act. We have the moral obligation to act. Um, a couple more slides, um, and, 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 I'll, and I'll finish. Uh, we have to foster critical hope. You know, uh, my colleague Jeff Duncan Andrade talks about this as um, hope in the face of overwhelming odds, right? That you have to foster that hope. It is our responsibility as a profession to have that hope. People come into our classrooms, they look at us, and what they need from us are, are reasons to believe, reasons to believe in the future, reasons to believe in their future, reasons to believe in themselves. How do you foster that hope? I know it's not easy. As my parents say, 48 years ago wasn't easy. 48 years from now, it will be easy. Don't wait for the end of the struggle. Struggle will be with us. Or I should say, the reasons for struggle will always be with us. I'm hoping that the struggle is with us, because that means we have the will and desire to face it. Struggle is a good thing, because oppression is a natural reality, and without struggle, oppression, oppression happens unabated. Think of the struggle as beautiful, because you are embracing it, and you are embracing the legacy of people who have struggled on behalf of what is right. And unfortunately, in this world we live in, Working for what is right will always be a struggle. New teachers don't wait for that struggle to go away because you will be disheartened. Just pray or hope that you have the strength to struggle because you are inheriting a legacy of greatness. Critical hope is essential to our future as a profession as it has been essential to the past. The next movement will be fueled by it. Finally, I want to say, um, what's love got to do with it? Everything. Everything. 
right? It is a term that we do not like to talk about. It is not sciency, like pedagogy is a cool term because it's got OGY, which means to study or something, right? <laughs> the curriculum, the lesson plans, the amazing diverse literature that you put in someone's hands means nothing if you do not love her. And think about what that means. What does that revolutionary love mean when it means when it's manifested by an English teacher? That that is a difference, right? That you believe in them. That them failing is you failing. You know, I think about this all the time. I have three children. And, you know, I, I send my children to school. And I don't expect, you know, 6.30 in the morning that their love is going to be right here. And then 9 o'clock in the morning is going to dip down here. While I'm at work and my wife's at work. And you better love my children, right? Because they deserve it 24 7. Right? We don't like to talk about this term. Think about um, you are operating in the public trust. The public trust. How many hours do I leave my children with other people and expecting my children to feel loved in the same way as they would in their own home? I like the parents of the other 50 million children who are in the school system. Love has everything to do with it. <laughs> It doesn't work without love. So it's important for us to think about that. And I will end you know, with a quote from a, a, a dear mentor um, to me, Ace Hilliard. And he said, I have never encountered any children in any group who are not geniuses. There is no mystery on how to teach them. The first thing you do is treat them like human beings. And the second thing you do is love them. And with that, I will say, in CTE, it has been an amazing privilege to be your president. Thank you. It's been an emotional week, I knew. I just had to give myself a little bit together for this whole talk. It's been, um, it's been a lot. Uh, so I have a few thank yous um, to do. The first, uh, you, I've been thanking as much as possible um, all of our past presidents and wonderful leaders of the organization. We thanked our um, executive committee. Uh, but I have to uh, take this time for a, a special thanks to our immediate past president, Sandy Hayes, who has been I hold your applause. I want to say a bunch of stuff about her, but she can come up here so I can brag on her uh, and thank her, acknowledge her. Uh, Sandy has been a tireless worker on behalf of this organization. Uh, she's been eighth grade teacher, 43 years in Becker, Minnesota. Uh, she's the most energetic fan of NTTE that you can imagine. Um, she's a, a fan of middle school education. She's a fan of teachers. Uh, she's a fan of young people. Uh, I, I have not seen anybody who has been more energetic. It has been an absolutely amazing honor um, to follow her in the presidency. Uh, and I just think that after all these years of work, four years on the presidential team, 10 years on the executive committee running, 43 years in America's classroom fighting the good fight, Join me in TTV and thanking Sandy Hayes for her amazing contribution. does not have the same challenges. Of course I have challenges. I have individual students, just like all of you. They have their challenges too, but whenever I come to NCTE, I am so humbled by the yeoman's work that everybody here does in earnest. I am not worthy. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Thank you.
we have two more pieces of business that will be fast. Um, the next one, uh, I just want to um, you know, give a, a, a tremendous thanks to the entire NTTE staff and the work that they've done. Amy Stark, our convention director, Jennifer Mordell, the communications and strategist, uh, Darren Cambridge, who's our director of policy research and evaluation, Myla Fuller, who is our deputy executive director, uh, Millie Davis, who works with affiliates and our social outreach program, uh, Joanna Wisniewski, who does everything absolutely possible. <laughs> But there's a there's there's a noticeable absence today. Um, we have this executive director who is um, an amazing director, and I just want to um, he he's on the road to recovery. He wants to be here so badly, um, and I just wanted NTTE um, to thank him for the work that he does and the work that he will continue to do on behalf of this organization. So I just want to give a, a huge shout out to Ken and say we're thinking about you. And with that, and on time, <laughs> um, it is my pleasure, you have no idea. Well, there's about 15 of you out there who have an idea. Uh, Lisa Kylie shaking her head. How much pleasure there is in handing this gavel over to uh, who is now your president of NTTE, Kathy Short. of what a, a phenomenally incredible president he has been. You know, Ernest has talked so much about um, the future and thinking about our future, but he always talks about it in the sense of we invent our future. It's not something that's thrust upon us. And I think that reminder from Ernest is, is one that um, sustains and, and carries me. And just as we heard his tremendous commitment to issues of diversity and social justice and at the very heart of that is because of that love for children. That's just shine through. I also want to just thank Ernest for what he's done in our executive committee meetings and presidential meetings. Um, he always is such a, has such a thoughtful contribution to our discussions and, and I've really appreciated his ability to always keep the bigger ideas, the, 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 you know, the bigger issues in his head that, and to remind us to pull us back to that at moments we get caught up in, into, in details. And the other thing I have to tell you about Ernest is that we sit around at, at dinner and we're telling stories. There is one person who always has the best story, <laughs> who always one-ups all the rest of us, and that is Ernest. <laughs> the stories of his childhood, the stories of his life, um, I, I'm waiting for the memoir is all I can say. Um, because he's lived such an, um, a diverse and interesting life. Uh, so many different experiences and, and there's so many pieces to his life. And I'm just so grateful that NCTE and, and, and all of us have been one part of that. And I want to thank him for the tremendous commitment and contributions that he's made to our broader work together. And that reminder that we always act together to invent the future. Thank you, Ernest.